I just got a video of someone taking uh, the bus from Lynn into Boston. It's full. It's full every day coming to and from Boston. And what that means to me is there are a lot of people who may not be in the highest wage earning who are commuting in. And I really question if they're getting the, the pre-tax benefits that they not only deserve, but certainly should be getting in this time. So there are a lot of essential workers who need these pre-tax benefits, who are using the bus, the commuter rail, and are coming in every single day to make sure that our city doesn't stop and come to a standstill. So there are economic benefits, there are um, recovery uh, conversations, and there are just outright, do we want a greener world uh, concept that we need to, to, um, to, to continue to lead on as a city of Boston. And so that's why this is so important that we push on this. I hope this, I look forward to, to hearing again from the advocates. Uh, they have such wonderful statistics about what this has done in other cities. So I'll leave those numbers for them, but also want to make sure when we lead this conversation, Chairwoman Wu, we're leading with a plan of action, what it will take, uh, what kind of ordinance, um, is this a volunteer thing? That's what I really also hope that we leave this conversation with. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak so long. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. We'll go next to Councillor Ed Flynn. Thank you, Councillor Wu, and, um, and thank you to Councillor Wu and to Councillor Edwards for organizing this important meeting. I just wanna say thank you to um, Vineet as, as well, an outstanding and dedicated professional uh, city employees. So we're lucky to have your expertise working on so many issues in the city of Boston. I'm looking forward to uh, learning more about this subject and, um, and th thank you again to the makers of this, uh, of this hearing and thank you to the uh, city administration for being here. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. Thank, thank you, Councilor Will. Councilor Braden. Thank you for this opportunity to um, join this con very important conversation. Um, and thank you for holding this hearing at such a very, very important time. Uh, I look forward to learning more. And uh, I also want to appreciate all the incredible um, work of the folks who are supporting our, able to, our ability to do these meetings, uh, the central staff behind the scenes who are helping us um, be able to do these Zoom meetings every day. Um, I really appreciate that because otherwise we wouldn't be able to do this important work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Braden. And I believe Council President Kim Janey has joined us as well. Uh, President Janey, would you like to make an opening statement? Thank you. I was a little slow with the, the video and the mute button there. So thank you for your patience. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, important conversation. Uh, just really grateful for your leadership, uh, Councilor Wu. Um, loving the virtual backdrop there. Uh, haven't been on a, a train in some time myself, um, but uh, uh, missing out on connecting with folks on the T. Uh, certainly an important uh, benefit. So want to understand how things are working, certainly uh, in the midst of COVID. Want to extend my appreciation to the administration uh, for their work and look forward to um, a productive hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Janey. Okay, let me do one more quick scan to see if there are any other colleagues. Okay, so I see a few folks in the waiting room to testify, but that looks like um, the list of counselors for now. So at this point, we will hand it over to Vineet Gupta from the Boston Transportation Department. Uh, Vineet, if you could, you know, feel free to introduce yourself, although we are very familiar with you. It's been a little while, but we're always grateful to see you and grateful for your work day in and day out. Um, if you could just give a little background on how uh, BTD has been thinking about this type of uh, potential collaboration and or requirement with employers in Boston and any other thoughts. Um, uh, thank you, Councillor Wu, and thank you, Councillors, for the kind words about the work that I do for the city. I really appreciate it in these difficult times. Uh, I should mention that I was going to be joined by Allah Mukahal. She is uh, uh, on the planning team here at BTD and is working full time on many of the issues we're going to discuss today. Oh, yes, okay, I think that is my fault. I, I see her in the um, 
waiting room now. So now she should be get, coming into the main session. Yeah, uh, thank you for letting her in. Uh, she's going to be able to uh, add to what I'm saying. Uh, she is, uh, thank you Allah for finally being on. Uh, Sorry, some technical issues. <laughs> She's been uh, with the department for about a year and has been working uh, hand in hand with, uh, with developers, with employers, uh, with transportation management associations throughout the city to address precisely the kind of issues that we're gonna talk about. I'm gonna spend five minutes giving you some background on uh, the work that we are already doing. And I will follow that up with uh, what our strategy is going forward. So I can get your guidance, I can learn from you. Uh, what's the right direction we should head in uh, given the situation now? So uh, as you know, the city of Boston already uh, gives its employees and it was very graciously mentioned in the, uh, in the order for this hearing, uh, gives its employees PPAS subsidies. We also give subsidies, uh, big subsidies for uh, people to take blue bikes. So there's both a transit and a bicycle subsidy that city employees uh, are eligible for. And I hope all of you are taking advantage of those as well. Uh, but having said that, we have started to uh, partner on two fronts uh, to have employers, uh, other employers provide similar subsidies and provide similar programs. On the one hand, uh, as was mentioned earlier, we really want to make sure that uh, employers in the neighborhoods, particularly in our small business districts, are able to provide employees with subsidies. Uh, to that front, we are actually, uh, we have the city of Boston uh, through the transportation department has set aside money and we would uh, work with uh, five to seven main street districts uh, when, when we're able to in the, in the summer and in the fall uh, to, uh, to fund them, to provide subsidies for T passes as well as for uh, blue bike passes. And we hope that that's, a, uh, that's kind of a message from City Hall that we care about people taking public transportation, people being on bikes and that to, it's, it's, and that this is seed money for employers in our neighborhoods to start providing subsidies. And I can get into the details of that later on, but that program is all set. Uh, Allah is going to start working with uh, Natalia Utube over at Economic Development uh, to identify uh, Main Street districts in the coming month. So that's one front. The other front is, and really we started this back in January before we had COVID, uh, we have started to meet with major employers uh, in Boston. And we did a meeting in January, uh, again, in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Economic Development, where we invited, and there was good attendance, uh, major employers in the city to talk about what they think is the best approach to provide subsidies to their employees. Uh, we had a really good uh, participation from major corporations. We had MGH in the room. We had Wayfair. We had Vertex from South Boston. We had Suffolk Construction, whose office, as you know, is in Roxbury. Uh, we had other startups from the South Boston area. Uh, we had uh, a Boston University as well. And we also invited MIT. And the reason why I mention MIT is because we we were able to showcase the program that MIT has installed for its employees, and which has been very successful in getting people out of cars and into, into the train, I mean, into the MBTA bus service and subway service. And so we also talked about what other cities are doing at that meeting. What we heard back from this focus group was that uh, there were two things. One was that TPAS subsidies only work if the MBTA provides good service so that people have an option to take uh, if in fact they're not driving in. So, and this is particularly true for people coming in from cities outside of Boston and taking them to rail. So that's one thing. And so providing TPAS subsidies has to go hand in hand with good public transportation service. The other piece, and this was really 
a more a policy discussion uh, was that the same employers have to stop giving free parking because if, if I have the option, even if I have a T-Pass subsidy, but at the same time I have free parking, then the chances are that I'll still continue to drive in. And so that's a bigger discussion. It's a bigger policy discussion, uh, but uh, many employers are in fact giving their employees free parking. We can understand that if it's for surgeons and all and other kind of critical services, then that makes sense. But uh, that's it. So those two those two pieces, good MBTA service and free parking have to go hand in hand. Right, and this is what we have learned from other cities as well. Uh, we feel going forward that the way to do this is to actually establish partnerships with major employers, offer them various programs uh, and see if they can be adopted. And to do that, we have actually uh, started to work with a better city, which is a transportation management association, also with Masco and the Seaport TMA, uh, to see if we can identify major employers who are willing to uh, volunteer really to, to start some of these programs. Uh, as a point of departure, and this is where COVID starts to come in. Uh, we are working with, uh, we have managed, we are close to getting a grant uh, to do a survey of major employers uh, in the coming, uh, probably in early fall, when all the paperwork is done for the grant, uh, to do a survey of major employers to see what travel habits they expect their employees to use uh, post-COVID or as we transition out of this COVID era. And that will give us a lot of information as to what programs work best. At this point, we think that this is not the right environment to ask employers to use up their uh, operating budget or you know, precious capital funds to large scale provide subsidies when that money can be used for other things that are COVID related. But that's an ongoing discussion. The second piece is that we really want to make sure that as we move forward, that these programs are initially provided on a volunteer basis and that we continue to work with our legal department to see what options we have uh, in terms of uh, how the city can uh, work with major employers to uh, establish these programs. So I guess I've been talking for too long, but in, in summary, we are working with our neighborhoods through a direct subsidy provided by the city. Uh, I should mention that that money is coming from the TNC fund. So it's, it's money that we're getting from TNCs that we are re, uh, what's the right word, re-channeling back to the neighborhoods. And uh, so that's one thing that we're doing right off the bat, that's city-led. And the other is that we are working with our partners, uh, the TMAs and major employers to see if they want to adopt uh, subsidy programs. And uh, I'll, uh, I should mention that I've been speaking continuously about everything that I've said, I've learned from Allah. So she's really the, the boss here and is, uh, has been very uh, diligent and honest in keeping us on the right path and uh, doing the right thing. Thank you, Vinay. Um, Allah, would you like to make a statement as well? I think Vinay covered it pretty well. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we will, I, I, I want to recognize also that Councilor Michael Flaherty has joined us. Uh, Councilor Flaherty, we had each given a, a brief statement. I, I want to extend that opportunity to you now as well in case you wanted to add anything before we dive into a few more um, speakers. So let's find our wave opening just to uh, continue the uh, good flow here. Okay, great. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Uh, then I, I see that we have one, two, three, four, and maybe a few more, but at least four um, organizations represented uh, from the advocacy community. So why don't we, I think it'd be good to just offer a little period of time to ask questions directly about Vinit's uh, statements and other programs that he brought up. And then we'll move over to um, the advocacy panel. Everyone will, will give a statement one by one, and then we'll ask questions of the advocates um, all together. If if Vinit has time, and, and if Vinit and Allah have time to stick around for that, feel free. Um, I also know you both have other commitments as well. So let's start with our city representatives and questions. So I'll go with to um, lead sponsor, Councillor Edwards first. 
Thank you very much, uh, Vineet, for your um, your testimony. Um, I'm. It was interesting. I'd never heard of this new program. I guess uh, about setting aside some money to subsidize commuting uh, costs of certain Main Street uh, businesses. So that's a new thing and a new development that we had not heard of before this hearing. Um, so I'd love for you to tell me how much money has been set aside. I also, before you go into the specifics of that, I really want to make sure we're all on the same page and understand what this ordinance is doing and what it's not. It does not in any way, shape or form requ require employers to provide a subsidy. Let me repeat that. It does not require a subsidy. It is requiring simply that they offer as a benefit to their workers a pre-tax um, election. That is it. It costs the employers virtually nothing. So unless you have an administrative cost analysis for each individual employer, and the irony is the bigger the employer, the more likely they already have this, right? The more okay. likely they already have um, yeah. a pre-tax benefit as part of their package. Yeah. So, uh, and I'm sure many advocates will be able to back this up because I, I, you know, the last point that you made particularly about how we're in the COVID, we're in a pandemic, and that this is not something we wouldn't want to place as an additional burden on employers, especially that they would tap into their capital funds or any of their operating costs. I wanna be very clear, it doesn't, it doesn't. This is supposed to, this is really honestly trying to help employees out and actually helps those essential workers by giving them a break in taxes because it dips into their pre-tax dollars, reducing their overall salary for tax purposes. That means they pay less in taxes. This is a benefit. And if you're talking about pandemic and saving money, I don't know why we wouldn't want employers in Boston to offer this benefit. The employees could choose not to take it. So again, just making sure we're all in the same count, right? Yeah. Because if, if cost is the why, we, why the administration is not going to want to mandate this, then one, it doesn't cost. It is an option. Right. Number two, since the administration's already set aside money to subsidize, which is more than what we were even asking for, which is great. So now we're, we're gonna actually pay to subsidize uh, other people commuting. Uh, one, how much did you set aside? And if you set aside money for that, why don't you use some of that money if there happens to be some municipal administrative costs for the pre-tax benefits? That would actually be cheaper, but okay. But still, if we have money set aside. So I, I wanna really make sure that we're clear on that because um, I am beyond excited about the program that you just mentioned. It's, it goes further and costs more than what we are suggesting. Uh, so go ahead. Uh, thank you, Councillor Edwards. Uh, when Allah and I were looking over the uh, looking over the city council order, that's exactly what we kind of uh, notice that the order doesn't actually ask for employers to spend money it's just simply giving uh, the tax benefit that similar to what's what we're doing at city at the city so okay. i wasn't in any way suggesting that uh that the the order asks employees to uh, to uh, set aside monies to provide the subsidy and it's in our discussions with major employers Many of them are actually already providing the subsidy. But as you mentioned, Councillor Edwards, the bigger you are, the easier it is for you to do this because you have a whole team of people in the you know in your administrative setup to be able to do what they have to do with the paperwork to to uh, to get the subsidy. Uh, so uh, absolutely, and it's, it's something that the city is going to uh, kind of press forward on to ask employees to to consider uh, uh, giving subsidies for their uh, for, em for employees. I'm mixing up my employer employee thing. But anyway. okay. uh, so that's one piece. The second piece, uh, the first question you asked was uh, relative to what this, this program, I will uh, confess, this is the first time we're talking about it. And uh, I really haven't discussed it in detail with leadership at, at City Hall, but uh, we we are trying to figure out how much money we can get from the TNC fund, and rest assured, as we give form to this program, we will be working with uh, the city council uh, to get your input as to uh, what shape and form it should take, who we should outreach to. Uh, I'm, I haven't even started a discussion with our uh, mayor's office of economic development, who will be our partners. So 
I'm probably jumping the gun a little bit and announcing this year, but I thought it was important to mention. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's still in its infancy. It's an idea that uh, Allah and myself and a couple of others from uh, the mayor's, I mean, from uh, uh, Chief Oscar's uh, staff uh, have been discussing. It's something that we think uh, is a good use of TNC monies because it uh, directs money back into the neighborhoods. So uh, we'll be sure to keep you in the loop as things go along, move along and as we design this program. Uh, thank you. So just to, just to recap what we'll get follow-ups on, um, just the size, the amount of money, um, right. and, and then also, uh, you know, how it's going to roll out. Um, I, I understand it's probably not part of the BTT budget because it's coming from a different source of funds, not our general funds, but from TNC. Right. Thank you very much. Um, one other, other things that might be helpful in the administration or the advocates who come and speak may have this information. What's the... Um, average administrative cost of pre-tax benefits administration. Um, you mentioned that many people do, or many companies or employers already do this. Do you know on average how many employers in Boston do provide it? This is to the whole crowd, not just, not just uh, um, Allah or Vinit, okay? And then also, um, what, is, what is the sweet spot? And that might, again, to the whole crowd. What's the sweet spot of the size of employer that this kind of policy could come in? I don't expect you to know that answer. I'm just saying those are things, but the only thing would be about the funding. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Wu. Thank you for allowing me to sneak some more questions in. Thank you. And we'll, um, I wanna bring the other panelists in to, to answer some of those questions as well. So um, maybe uh, Vineet, if you have a quick, just reply just on that piece of, does the city have that information? Mm -hmm. uh, the, short, the short answer is no. Okay. Uh, we can, we can uh, work with, uh, maybe through that survey I was talking about, that can be a question to employers mm -hmm. to, to try and get that information. We could, uh, so uh, yeah, the short answer is no. Okay, great. Uh, very helpful. So why don't we do other counselor questions just for the administration? Um, and then we'll, we'll bring advocates into the conversation shortly as well. Um, okay, so next was counselor Ed Flynn. Oh, Councilor Flint. Councilor Flint, we'll get one more chance, but I think he may have stepped away and then we'll just go right down the line. Okay, um, after Councilor Flint is Councilor Liz Braden. I have no further questions at this time. Thank you, Councilor. Oh, I see Councilor Flynn is back. Sorry, we, we jumped right over. Um, right, Councilor Flynn, did you have questions for Vinit or Allah? Oh, I think you're on mute, Councillor. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Well, um, I had no questions. Um, again, thank you to the administration and to the makers for this uh, important hearing. Thank you. Um, President Janey, do you have questions for the administration? Thank you so much. Just a, a few questions, and I certainly appreciate the earlier questions um, from my colleague, Councillor Edwards. I also didn't know about the new initiative and would love uh, more information about um, that uh, as it relates to Main Streets. I have a couple of Main Streets in, in my district. Um, I am interested in uh, understanding how many uh, city employees are currently enrolled in our uh, uh, transit pass program. I'm not sure I heard that. Uh, in your uh, opening and um, whether or not we've seen any either increase or decrease around COVID for employees who were utilizing this program. And I would assume this is like a prepay kind of thing. You get kind of the pre-tax dollar benefit or whatever it is. Um, if in fact, people have been working uh, from home uh, for you know all the month of April, I'm just wondering if people were they, did they have to pay for that? Did they have to automatically opt out? Um, how are they being taken care of um, if they're not utilizing that benefit, let's say? Um, and then I have the same kind of questions given that the May 4th deadline that the governor uh, put out a few weeks back is likely to be extended. He, I don't think he's made any announcements just yet, but it's hard to believe that um, folks are going to go back to whatever their their view of, of normal uh, is next week. So it's clear to me that we will um, 
have to extend this, this stay at home uh, piece when it comes to not just keeping residents safe, but in terms of uh, businesses that are up and running. And so those that are relying on TPAS programs, I'm just wondering how that is playing out for employees. Um, and then I had a question, I'm so sorry, uh, sir, if I could just get these all out and then you can feel free to um, answer them uh, as, as you wish. I, I know in your opening, Vinit, you did make mention of employees who get the benefit of TPAS, but too many of them still have parking with their job. And the fact that they are getting free parking, um, that's not really an incentive for them to want to then get on the T. And so I would like to understand more those numbers, um, how many city uh, employees are getting free parking uh, with their job, um, but are, I mean, free T pass, excuse me, but are still opting to drive. I wonder if you have uh, those numbers. And then I, I will pause. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Councilor Jenny. Uh, I don't have those numbers with me right now. I can definitely work with our uh, HR department to uh, to get those numbers. I think uh, particularly relative to how many employees are taking advantage of the pre-tax uh, benefit for, for an MBTA pass. So that should be a statistic that we can get easily. And is everyone eligible? Like yeah. all employees are just eligible because you're an employee. So really when you get that number is how many is taking advantage of it. Yeah. That's and, understanding uh, using the T. Okay. Right. And I know that there have been some discussions with the T relative to if you didn't use your pass at all, let's say for the month of April, uh, can that be, uh, because everybody's on a kind of a monthly recurring uh, kind of uh, a subtraction from their, from their paycheck you know, pre-tax subtraction from their paycheck. So you have to work through the bureaucracy with the MBDA to figure that out, but yeah. I can- But the goal, that some... just so that I understand, the goal is to make people whole if they weren't using it. And then what about us as a system? So if we as a system, as a city are not using this, do we get to recoup some of our money back from the, the MBTA? Is that how this is going to work, I, I uh, hope? I, I all got questions. It, it's something that I, I, like I said, I don't have the details on that. I can work with our human resources department to kind of get into the weeds with that. And we can get back to you on, on those numbers and what the overall strategy is relative to the month of April. And then my final question, if I may, Madam Chair, I, I am intrigued about your comments that you made in your opening about uh, city employees um, you know, they're not being an incentive to take advantage of this uh, wonderful uh, program because people are still driving. I, I'd, I'd be interested if there are any campaigns underway to get people to leave their cars and maybe take the tea. If you guys are thinking about some sort of campaign uh, that would encourage that, um, if there's some other way we could, and I know this comes to a head um, at many of our schools. So I know many of our teachers yeah. enjoy uh, driving to work and parking. Um, but for many of the residents in that area, there's this tension around uh, limited parking. And so I wonder if there's a way that we could utilize this program more to encourage at least those who live close enough to take the key um, so that we don't have these fights between residents and our, our educators um, and I know it plays out, and I'm sure there are other places that this plays out, but I, I know that's one. So I just wanted to yeah. highlight that. Um, thank you, Madam President. I think that's it for me. I would be interested in the follow-up uh, to my questions as well as the questions that uh, Councilor Edwards uh, put on the table. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you, President Janey. We'll make sure we add that to the follow-up list. Um, and Vinny, did you have any follow-up comments to th that last bit of questions? Uh, no, I, I think those are all very good questions for us to uh, pursue, and uh, I think the more information that we have, the the more informed our policy will be going forward. So uh, it's uh, Allah and I were talking about maybe doing a survey of every city employee, uh, particularly the school department. And I know that city hall most people take the tea, but I think it's in the other buildings that uh, that mm -hmm. are of issue here. And as Councilor Janey mentioned, you know this whole thing about parking for teachers and parking for residents. I know from all the community meetings that I've been to over the years that this often comes up. Great, thank you very much.
Uh, next was Councillor Flaherty for any questions. Oh, I think Councillor Flaherty was, looks like we might, we might be having a connection issue. We'll give it, okay, we will um, pause on Councillor Flaherty. I, I think there's something happening with his connection and return to him when he's back in on the Zoom. Um, so now let's bring in some of the voices from the advocacy community on the panel. I see Julia, uh, Julia Wallace from the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, Jason Pavichuk from COAST, Coalition for Smarter Transportation, um, Christiana Lacusa from Livable Streets, Angela Johnson Rodriguez from T for MA. Uh, so why don't we start, uh, I think that was roughly the order in which people arrived at the hearing as well. So feel free if you could give a, just a brief statement and then we'll open it up to questions from counselors or the advocates as well. So we'll start with Julia. Hi, can you all hear me? Everyone, yes, okay, great. we can hear you. You know what, maybe, so I wasn't prepared for video on this, but I can go ahead and go for it. All good? Perfect. Okay, um, so just to be clear, we're here to provide testimony, um, not necessarily be a, a panelist, but happy to answer any questions after all, uh, after this. So um, anyway, thanks so much. Um, so uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Wu and members of the committee for holding this hearing today. My name is Julia Wallers, and I'm the program manager for the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, that's IGDP, and we are a global nonprofit headquartered in New York but working in seven countries around the world to develop and promote sustainable and equitable transportation solutions. Um, since 2013, we've been in, working in Boston primarily on exploring the potential for bus rapid transit um, to transform the, the region's transportation system, strengthen our economy and our communities and a response to climate change. So I'll skip over, I'll submit a letter as well. Um, like our partners who are on the call today, uh, T for Mass and Livable Streets Alliance, we fully support the order sponsored by Council Wu and Council Edwards today to provide private employers to offer pretext hand transit benefits to their employees in an effort to encourage the use of broader commuter options to reduce roadway congestion. In the midst of today's COVID-19 crisis, it's hard to believe that just a few short months ago, we in Greater Boston were grappling with the harsh realities of having the worst traffic congestion in the nation. For the second year in, the row, in a row, costing the average driver thousands of dollars and countless hours in lost time. Employers have increasingly struggled to attract and retain workers as a result of these worsening conditions, which combined with high housing costs have caused more people to consider moving or leaving the region altogether. So as the state looks ahead to a reopening of the economy and many employees prepare to return to their commutes, it's reasonable to expect that these conditions will resume in urgency as well. We at IGDP know from our partners in China that in places where lockdowns have been lifted and business operations have resumed, there was a significant uptick in purchase of new vehicles and an increase in people choosing to drive to work. A survey conducted in March of 2020 found that subway and bus ridership in some cities had fallen by more than 50%, while the percentage of car driving increased by 5% or more. At the same time, it should be noted that bike share memberships and interest in walking has surged. The fear of using transit in a post-pandemic world is something for which we must be prepared and which can be addressed as effectively by governments and the private sectors through safety measures undertaken by the transit agencies providing the service. Employers have a unique opportunity to influence the community behavior of their employees by offering financial benefits, uh, as you've discussed today, for people to choose transit. And at the same time, local government policymakers like yourselves can facilitate that behavior of employers to do just that by instituting transit benefit ordinances or TBOs. Studies have shown that in places where TBOs exist, there are more employers offering transit benefits, more employees using these benefits and more employers expanding their existing programs. As you know, many employers in Boston and Greater Boston like MIT and Liberty Mutual and many others already offer these benefits on a voluntary basis. And as you discussed, replying, requiring all employers to offer these benefits pre-tax to employees for use to use transit reduces their taxable income at no additional cost to the employer. 
So just as we can expect to see similar trends towards increased automobile and driving use in a post-COVID-19 world here, as has been seen in China over the, couple, the coming months, we can also expect to experience the same benefits reaped by other U.S. cities who have already adopted TBOs if this order is approved. San Francisco, an example, saw over 44,000 employees shift from driving alone to other forms of transit after an ordinance like this was put into a place, which of course was accompanied by great reductions in CO2 emissions. Um, and there are many TMAs here in Boston that are working very hard to um, encourage our employers to offer incentives. We strongly encourage the committee to pass this order so it can be adopted by the entire council and put into place to support workers both who choose or rely on a transit commute in Boston and by requiring employers to do their part. Thanks so much for your consideration. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, I see Councillor Flaherty is, I think, back and connected. I wanted to offer him a chance to ask any questions of Vinit as, and Allah as well. Let's find out. I'm going to continue to listen to the testimony, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. So next up, let's go to um, Jason from Coast. Good afternoon. Hopefully you all can see me, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to speak with you all today. Uh, and again, I want to Jason, thank we don't quite, I mean, I mean, it's lovely. We see, unless you are a map of the T, that's oh. popping up, but we don't see you. There you go. I am a map of the T. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and I don't know why my eyes are glowing, but we'll pretend that I'm not the monster Zool from, from Ghostbusters. <laughs> I'll fix that in a moment here. So I apologize for the Zool looking character. Uh, my name is Jason Pavlchuk and uh, I am with the Coalition for Smarter Transportation. We are in uh, a national organization dedicated to uh, smarter transportation options. Uh, our role is to work with cities, uh, local governments, as well as uh, the federal level to, to bring about what we call smarter transportation policy. Uh, that means moving people using technology, but also moving people with better and smarter technology. I personally have been involved with all six of the transit benefit ordinances that have uh, uh, passed nationwide uh, and want to share some of the uh, success stories that we have seen. Uh, first of all, obviously, in light of COVID-19, I just want to reiterate, uh, I think, some of the sentiments that have been expressed so far. What we have seen, what we have, uh, have talked with, with folks at, at a variety of different uh, organizations, including the Texas Transportation Institute and others, is that uh, what COVID-19 will do is provide a, a bad mix of low gas prices, uh, rest restoration of transit services, as well as a false sense of security as people get back to work. Um, this will not be a, a we're back to work tomorrow situation. We're slowly going to get back to work. So congestion on uh, the mass pike today is, is probably uh, a fraction of what it was uh, in February, um, and that will slowly restore. So it gives people a false sense of you know, I can drive alone to work. Um, here we are, though, nine months, 18 months later, where congestion will be uh, astronomically higher than it was today because of that false sense. We believe the transit benefit is one of many tools that uh, we believe can can restore and provide uh, individuals with, with options and, and encourage them to utilize transit. Again, reiterating what uh, Councillor Edwards had, had said, this is not um, a, a situation where employers are forced to pay for anything. Um, I can speak to a little bit of the cost here uh, in a moment, um, but what I want to really speak to is, is the transit benefit ordinances work. Uh, as Julia had mentioned, 44,000 people uh, left their cars as a result of the transit benefit ordinance in, in San Francisco. That is huge mode shift. Um, that is not simply paying people to do what they're already doing. It's, it's cars off the road, it's reductions in BMT, it's reductions in um, and, and, and emissions, uh, and it makes uh, the transportation system system more effective for everyone. Uh, one thing I also want to mention is a sense of equity. Uh, right now, in cities where you have um, uh, transit benefits that are not ordinances, most of the companies that provide it and most of the entities who receive transit benefits are, are uh, upper to middle upper middle class individuals. Uh, there was a study by USF that showed in cities without any type of ordinance. Um, lower income individuals were not provided access uh, as at a high rate as, as upper income uh, constituents. Where you have in San Francisco, and now we're getting some studies from New York and DC where the transit benefit ordinance is help provide equity to who gets the benefit. 
it's no longer upper class um, uh, workers, it's, it's the entire of employers. So we think that's a very, very important point as well, that the ordinance um, helps to create that. A couple of misnomers, we like to sort of remind folks, I think there's a general sense that everyone assumes that everyone gets the transit benefit. Um, what we found in San Francisco is that less than 50% of all companies offered a transit benefit ordinance or transit benefit prior to the ordinance. And now utilization rate is near 100%. Uh, we've also found that how you enforce it is an important part of the process. Um, it should not be a heavy hand. We actually believe that the best enforcement um, uh, utilization uh, is, is actually in New York City, where they have essentially a, a hotline that if you as an employee aren't receiving a benefit, you call a hotline and you whistleblow on your company. What we have found is that almost bar none, every whistleblower complaint has simply been an employer that didn't know that they were subject to the, the ordinance um, and that it was fixed almost immediately. So, um, you know, I, I think sounds one or two cases in most situations, uh, employers, when they found out that they were in violation, fixed it immediately. The final thing I'll talk about is the role of employers. Um, this is actually a benefit and an ordinance that employers save money on. Um, the average cost to an employer uh, for transit benefit, depending on which company you use or what system you use, is about three to 5% of the overall cost of the, of the benefit itself. And when you consider that employers receive a 7.15% or 7.65% payroll tax reduction as a result of the transit benefit, it makes perfect sense that employers actually make money by offering a pre-tax benefit. That's not taking into account uh, money saved from less parking uh, and, and higher productivity and all the indirect impacts that a, a transit benefit can have and can play. So um, I, I like to say that, well, this is an ordinance and many employers see ordinances as vegetables, something they don't necessarily want. Sometimes they know they need it. Um, I think this vegetable is deep fried and covered in whatever type of cheese you want um, to the point where in, in San Francisco, New York and others where the ordinance was originally sunset after a few years, um, the Chambers of Commerce came out in active support of restoring the benefit uh, and restoring the ordinance, which is, is very rare in, in city life where employers being told what to do, they say, please. So with that, I, I will, will stop and hopefully my Zool eyes will go away um, and I will certainly answer any questions at the conclusion here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason, um, for that glowing testimony, very, and, and, and so informative um, as well. We will go next to um, Christiana, then Angela. Great. Hi, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak at this hearing today. My name is Christiana Lacusa, and I'm the Community Engagement Manager for Livable Streets Alliance. We at Livable Streets Alliance are strongly in support of a transportation benefit ordinance for employers in the city of Boston. We thank Councillor Edwards and Wu for holding this hearing to discuss this important initiative. As many are aware, the large percentage of people driving alone to work, 39% of Bostonian commuters in 2018, contributed to the congestion crisis in Boston before COVID-19 hit. These transportation choices have negative impacts on public health, climate change, and our economy. A transportation benefit ordinance would support the mode shift goals proposed by the city of Boston in Go Boston 2030. The city's 2030 goal for commutes by public transit is 45%. As of 2018, only 32% only of Bostonians commute, commutes are by transit, an amount that has actually slightly decreased since the plan's development in 2014. Employers can play a large role in incentivizing commuting via public transit or active transportation modes like biking through the provision of transportation benefit ordinance. Transportation benefits have resulted in mode shift in places like Cambridge, where MIT and many businesses in Kendall Square do offer them currently. According to the Kendall Square Business Association, more than 40% of people traveling to work in Kendall Square currently use transit, or as I should say, pre-COVID, we're using transit. Uh, there are two types of MBTA riders, choice riders and those who rely on transit with no other options. Transportation benefits will help both of these groups of people. For choice riders or those who have the financial means to choose to drive, transportation benefits reduce the daily cost of transit as compared to driving, making transit even more cost-effective and competitive and therefore encouraging them to switch how they travel. For those transit riders who have no other options, many of whom are low income, transportation benefits will allow them to save money that they would have spent on transit, thus helping keep money in the pockets of those who need it most. 
If an ordinance is passed in Boston, it's important that, as Vineet had mentioned, these pre-tax transportation dollars are not permitted to cover parking costs, since subsidizing parking further encourages driving. When people do begin to work, return to work after COVID-19 stay-at-home advisory has been lifted, we have a unique opportunity to adjust how people commute. A transportation benefit ordinance would encourage commuters to make the choices that will help prevent the return of our congestion crisis. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, and then next, we'll, uh, last but not least, we'll hear from Angela. All right, I think I'm off of mute. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. Um, my name is Angela Johnson Rodriguez, and I'm the Statewide Organizing Director at T for Mass, Transportation for Massachusetts, and I live in JP. Um, we don't always get the opportunity to testify in front of you all, so just a quick note, T for Mass is a diverse coalition of 90 member and partner organizations across the state with a state in improving transportation options across the Commonwealth. We want a transportation system that strengthens our economy and our communities while also being safer, healthier, more affordable, reliable, and above all, accessible. So before the COVID-19 crisis turned our society upside down nearly all aspects of our daily lives, the greater Boston area had the undesirable place of having the worst traffic congestion in the country based on annual surveys by Inrix, as some of, our, um, some of my fellow um, advocates have also stated. This resulted in approximately 149 hours or six full days of lost time due to congestion and costing $2,205 per driver also in lost time. So it's a lot of money that we're losing currently by just sitting in our cars on the pike each day. What we also know is that Boston ranks highest, excuse me, not highest, but near highest, thankfully, in national rankings for cost and costs of living, including housing utility costs. So requiring employers to offer pre-tech transit benefits will lower transit costs for all employees while also helping low-income riders most. These benefits would expand opportunities for low-income workers by, in, by easing the burden of transportation costs, which can shut out many people from applying for jobs in the first place. This ordinance would enhance equity in our transportation system for all transit riders. Requiring employers to offer pre-tax transit benefits creates incentives for employees to use transit for reducing their taxable income at no additional cost to, for their employer. A 2005 study by the Federal Transit Administration shows that after the federal government was mandated to offer pre-tax benefits for employees, the number of employees participating in the program doubled. And to expound on the um, note about San Francisco and their 44,000 employees who shifted from driving alone to using broader um, transportation options, that shift also resulted in an estimated 35,778 tons of CO2 reductions. So the emissions from the transportation sector there fell exponentially after people shifted from driving by themselves to using the metro, to using Muni, um, and other sort of um, services that are being offered in San Francisco. And this is after just the first 12 months of the program's implementation. So really there's no reason to believe that the greater Boston area could not see similar results if this was also, if this ordinance was also passed. Other municipalities such as DC, Seattle, Los Angeles, and New York City have passed or are, are also in the process of adopting similar policies. The city of New Jersey has, has passed a law requiring employers with more than 20 employees to offer pre-tax transit benefits to reduce congestion and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a topical issue that many of our friends across the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic are also thinking about. We strongly encourage the committee to pass this order so they can be adopted by the entire council and put in place to address congestion issues in Boston by requiring employers to do their part. We know that once the COVID-19 crisis has subsided and people start commuting again, we will need stronger policies in place to incentivize commuting behaviors that will continue to reduce congestion and greenhouse gas emissions. Policies like this order will improve employee productivity, broader transportation accessibility, and benefit our overall public health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela, and to all the advocates. Um, I know our uh, representatives and friends from the transportation department have another commitment soon. So I'm gonna take a, a, ask my own few questions for Manit and Lala. And then um, if any other counselors have questions for the administration particularly, could you please just raise your blue hands 
on Zoom and we'll quickly get those in as well before um, they are off to, to keep serving the city. So um, just on my part, Vineet and Allah, if you could help understand, are there plans to um, know on the city side how many employers are offering this kind of benefit? The T, and I, I could take this question, Vinny. We can get that number from the T. Um, and that's okay. not the, the, the total number of employers that offer pre tax transit benefits. You, you, as you may know, that usually happens through the T's program called the PERC program. Yep. And so we can get that number immediately. Absolutely. Okay, great. And I guess I'm trying to understand does that live somewhere in the city? Is there someone, so once we have that number, for example, is there somewhere in the city where there's an active push to increase it? Um, separate from the, the new program that I'm very excited uh, we have learned about today. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. So th that's what Allah is going to be focused on. Got it. Uh, with, with the help from all of us at uh, the transportation and other departments. And it's, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we started to establish a partnerships with, uh, with the TMAs already, including doing a survey to, to drive and uh, move this forward. Okay, great. And then um, just maybe a, a add on to the request for information about the new program when you're ready. Um, if we could just really understand how the decisions for allocation will be made. Uh -huh. You know, I, uh, I think I every year register my uh, discontent with the safe streets program and, and application processes that then tend to at least have the perception of benefiting those who are more politically connected. Uh, so I see two colleagues have further questions for, for you both. First, Councillor Edwards, and then Councillor Flaherty after that. Thank you very much. Um, I understand you are, are pressed for time. So I will leave these questions if you have an answer now or later. I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, so having heard the testimony about some of the amazing benefits for employers um, that they actually make money sometimes on top of this and having fought to have it come back, I'm curious about um, your overall thought now about the transportation benefits um, and and having the city um, have a requirement and uh, the idea of, of just a hotline as one of the ways in which it's enforced. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we want to do this through uh, starting with partnerships while our legal department, because you just can't impose from the top every time. And I think that it's important to work with major employers and employers in the neighborhoods to really understand uh, how this would work. So we need to do that first as we move towards figuring out from a legal perspective, whether it's the state or the city that can uh, uh, kind of require employees, uh, sorry, employers okay. yeah. to, uh, to install uh, this program uh, in their in the workplace and so it's it's, def it's something definitely that we are uh, we are looking at right now and exploring further it makes a lot of sense uh it's uh it's not uh a direct you know it's it, it's just administrative cost which can be recouped uh so uh it's something that we're definitely supporting i should mention that we've supported this for years actually and have, have been working with, so for example, all our transportation access plan agreements mm -hmm. that we signed for new developments have, have asked that tenants in those buildings be given T-PASS subsidies. So, but, but new developments are only a small percentage of all employees in the city, but that's something that we've been doing for over 10 years since I've been around. And for those, that's the TAP agreements, correct? Correct. Correct. And, um, and just to make sure, so the city is already requiring new employers or folks coming in to new developments, excuse me, to uh, actually pay subsidy, at we, least off, off we, of that? We, uh, not all, uh, there's no ordinance covering that. We talk with each developer individually right now, mm -hmm. to, and many developers are actually providing the subsidy. Uh, we can, I can give you some good examples of uh, uh, developers who have required their tenants to give the subsidy to their, uh, to people who move into the building. Uh, I think it's great. I think it's, it shows an incredible leadership. And so what I'm hearing from you is right now, it's uh, how do we get that leadership? 
uh, is it continued negotiation directly as you've been doing as your department or do we do or is an ordinance an, uh, an available tool and how at what level that I'm hearing overall and I, I don't want to put words in your in your mouth that the concept is not at issue the concept of pre-tax benefits is not an issue it's how it would be rolled out and and whether an ordinance should be backing it up that's a fair that's fair uh, correct, absolutely, and I, I should mention that uh, we are for, for new developments. Uh, 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 Allah has taken on the task of creating a points-based system that will allow some certainty, uh, mm -hmm. so that developers know what their costs are up front, which is something they always want to know, and uh, uh, it's a transparent process by which developers take a decision on if they are providing that subsidy or not. And so it, it's, it's, it's not, you know, I, see in, in, I, I, I don't want to, I, I know before you go, so this is, you will not have an answer for, but I would love, love, love for, to see your TAP agreements for any future uh, development on PDA, such as Suffolk Downs, you know, that they're expecting Counselor. a massive amount. So I'm Counselor. excited about that. I'm sure you're already doing it. I'm, Counselor, I just, I'm excited. You see, Counselor, you can actually see every single TAP, uh, every known executed TAP in existence on our website today. Uh, at the, on the transportation development review website, we work very hard to make sure that uh, every single TAPA that we have known that is that is executed to be scanned and uploaded online, and we will soon have a map to show you every building that is associated with every TAPA. Wonderful, and I, I expect the entire campus of Suffolk Downs eventually to have the best TAPA ever. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Chair Thank you, thank you, Councilor Edwards. Um, Allah, if it's possible, would you be able to? If it's easy for you um, in the moment, could you just drop that in the chat so that we could yes, see that absolutely. one side as well? Okay, thank you very much. And um, I know Councillor Flaherty had his, wanted to ask some questions as well. Thank you, Madam Chair, woman. And uh, I had some uh, technical difficulties joining earlier. Not sure if it was mentioned, but it was. I was sad to learn that uh, there was a cyclist fatality uh, within the week over at uh, Mass and, and Harrison. So uh, my thoughts are, are with. Um, you know, that uh, individual's family and, and uh, the cyclist organizations who have obviously been continue the fight to uh, to make our streets uh, safer. Um, I wanted to ask either of the admin and or the advocates uh, and activists as to what they envision uh, when, um, when we open back up uh, after the COVID-19 response, um, what are their constituencies uh, saying or what are they hearing um, through whether it's social media uh, and or other um, teleconferences as to particularly folks that depend on public transportation, uh, what do they plan on doing? And also people who opt to take public transportation just to avoid whether traffic, uh, et cetera. Are they already indicating what their desires to do and, and, and what conversations are we currently having with uh, the MBTA uh, and others um, uh, like Keolis, et cetera, to anticipate um, how the public is gonna respond um, when you know we're back open for business? Uh, um, are they putting additional service on? Is it going to be uh, uh, social distancing uh, in, 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 in on the train and on the buses? So I'd be curious to see what conversations the administration is having and or what conversation the advocates and activists are having among themselves as to what the plan of action is. Hypothetically say, you know, we're back open for business on Monday. Clearly that's not the case. May 4th uh, has been moved back, I believe, to May 18th. But in the event that, you know, next Monday was going to be the day, what's the plan? Uh, what do they anticipate the public doing? And, and how we're responding to it uh, as a government. Thank you, Councillor. Would uh, Vanita or Allah like to answer that first? Oh, just quickly, I, I do know from the, that the MBTA is uh, putting together a plan of action of how uh, they'll gradually increase service uh, back to levels of pre-COVID and uh, how uh, you know, are face masks going to be mandatory? Will there still be social distancing? Uh, are they going to limit the number of people standing at a platform? Uh, those kinds of uh, uh, transit agencies throughout the world have started to figure this out. And I think that uh, we're going to learn from Asia and from Europe uh, how to do this. And so the MBTA is putting together the, their game plan uh, again, we don't have to flip a switch. It's going to be a gradual transition uh, as more and more people uh, kind of get back to whatever the new normal is relative to going to work. And so 
uh, I know that that's an ongoing process and uh, the city is, uh, is, uh, is going to uh, review the work that the T is doing. And thank you for that, Vinny. And if, if the city can sort of be responsible for uh, making sure that, uh, particularly on the communication side, um, that that message is getting out there, that it's clearly communicated uh, yeah. in, in multiple modems as well as in, in multiple languages to make sure that uh, for those that um, that uh, take public transportation that they've got advance notice as to what the decisions uh, are and, and, um, and the city should be playing a role in, in either uh, sort of uh, co-piloting, if you will, or amplify, being in a position to amplify and giving people sufficient time and notice. So uh, uh, I'd like to make sure that that happens. Uh, absolutely, and uh, you know, to the mayor's leadership, we'll make sure that uh, the message gets out appropriately. Great, thank you. I know um, the advocates might have answers to Councillor Flaherty's question about what you've been seeing and hearing, uh, but just given that the administration has a time deadline, I want to make sure if Councillor Sabi George has any questions for Vinit or Allah um, about the hearing or BTD in general. Uh, we have a few more minutes with them, so thank you. Right, for thank you. I, I've tuned in late. I had another commitment, so I will just review the tape and fo follow up online if I have questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, um, last call for counselor questions for the administration. Let me just double check this um, participant list to see if I'm missing anyone. Okay, I think we are good, so we will thank our, our colleagues at, at BTD for all of your work and um, really hone in on the advocates and, and your organizational work and the constituencies that you are plugged in with. Um, if anyone wants to chime in on Councillor Flaherty's question, what are you thinking and hearing and envisioning as we move towards a potential reopening at some point? This is Jason Pelican. I'll start. And this is a question in meetings that we've been having for, for days and weeks, and I don't, I don't think the answer is going to be one you like, because um, I think really our transportation system is is so so slow to move and so slow to, to change. I mean, you see it every day, just in, in response to normal situations. Um, this is an earth shattering, earth altering situation, and I think some of the challenges that we've seen is is how do we you know move the ship in a direction where we're, we're very very responsive and very very uh, quick to deliver um, solutions for for situations, and and I don't think there's a a, a magic wand. I think it's going to take a lot of, of action, like this type of, of ordinance, this type of action. I think it's going to take um, you know working with um, in a variety of of different partners that include the MBTA. Um, I think it's going to take, in some cases, leadership from municipal governments to begin to create and start services on their own, like a micro transit service and long distance commute services. Um, and I think that's leaving it alone to the MBTA is unfair to the MBTA. Um, you know, they're going to have a huge financial shortfall here. I, I think what, what Congress provided, as you all find out sooner rather than later, I believe, is not nearly enough for them to to address. The, the, the revenue decline as well as the long-term needs that I think are going to grow from this. Um, but I do believe that that the, the actions needed are more um, social, are more directive, rather than necessarily only let's provide as much capital as possible. So I think conversations like this are very, very timely. Thank you. Thank you for that. And if I may just interject, Madam Chair, and Obviously, the, one of the concerns is one of the concerns is that the, the vehicle will probably be the safest means, in a sense of from the social distancing standpoint. And I guess my question and concern is to, to folks that sort of normally and traditionally would be taking the T because of. Uh, and again, this is something we're going to have to continue to push for. Uh, I know Council Wu and as Chairwoman has led the effort around trying to uh, ask the T uh, to to make the T free. But in the very beginning, uh, whether you support that idea or you don't, in the very beginning. I would expect that MBTA should not be collecting fares initially when we reopen, and there should be no long lines at the kiosks and, and on the platforms and, and et cetera. So we need to obviously be cognizant of that. But I guess the question through the various constituencies is do, do people default back to the vehicle um, because from the social distancing standpoint, they don't have to worry about being in, in, in long lines and on platforms and in crowded cabs and 
uh, train train cars and and then and then uh, and, and buses. So I don't know what the, your various constituencies are talking about, but my sense would be that uh, folks would err on the side of that, and and and, and or their family members would be encouraging them for the time being. Once we open back up, probably to revert back to to their household vehicle to get to and from wherever they're going. And I don't know whether or not that is sort of the uh, is the buzz on 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 the wavelengths with respect to the, the various organizations. But I'm assuming that those are conversations that are happening in households between spouses and family members as to when we open back up. What is the safest mode of travel to get to and from work or to get to and from an appointment and one would argue, uh, unless um, the T has this thing figured out, unless we have a plan, and unless they're gonna adhere to sort of the new standards coming forward, I would argue that the safest mode of transportation is gonna be your own car. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I want to, I, okay, I see Christiana wants to chime in on this. I wanted also just uh, recognize that Anthony Labrador, uh, Tony has been waiting patiently to testify. He was in the public testimony waiting room. So I thought now was a good point to bring him in to make sure that he had a chance to say something. Um, so why don't we go to Tony and then we'll return to this question and then back around to other counselors who have questions for the advocates. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me come in. I appreciate it. I just want to talk a little bit. I'm the director of sales for uh, Enterprise Holdings, one of the divisions of Enterprise Rent-A-Car uh, I manage is uh, Commute with Enterprise in addition to the commercial contracts for uh, companies and business partnerships throughout New England. Um, you know, Commute with Enterprise is obviously a Van Poole organization, a Van Poole uh, company that um, it's, it's basically an organized carpool, for lack of better words, whereby individuals agree to, uh, you know, ride together to and from work uh, to create initially a, a cleaner, uh, better commute for those specific individuals who typically live in the same area and work either at the same company or within close proximity to one another. Uh, the group works out the details of, you know, where to meet in the morning, possibly at someone's house, a park and ride or a specific location. Uh, and one of them uh, is charged with driving the vehicle. Uh, sometimes one person drives to the location, sometimes one person drives from the work site uh, at the end of the day, the vehicle is housed or garaged either at a park and ride or at someone's uh, individual home. Um, you know, when you look at what Enterprise's role is from a van pooling perspective, uh, we provide the vehicles, the maintenance, the insurance on the vehicles, um, in addition to uh, working with employers across the nation to uh, create these van pools and get these vehicles on the road. Uh, obviously with COVID-19, we've seen an uptick from particular uh, business partners to create more of these vehicles to social distancing where people and essential employees have to get to and from work. So we are seeing a, a significant uh, interest in what this looks like, not only with the here and now, but also with the long term of how people are gonna commute back and forth to work in a, in a specific environment. Um, you know, in Boston uh, specifically, we've got approximately 125 vans um, unfortunately, unfortunately, like uh, some other major metro areas across the country, neither the NBTA nor the state has a formal van pool program. Uh, thus, the cost of it to the van pool uh, participants is significantly higher across the uh, here in Boston than it is in many other uh, metropolitan areas throughout the United States. The transit benefit is the only way that you can bring that number down. Uh, by as much as 33%, making it a cost-effective and more affordable uh, way to commute to and from work. I think when you look at it, the role of the transit benefit, uh, van, pool, van pooling particularly addresses those folks who don't have access to, uh, to mass transit because they're commuting from far distances. Uh, they may also live considerably uh, far distance away from an MBTA station or a bus route. Uh, other metro areas uh, that have ordinances in place have seen significant growth in van pooling. Uh, it's, as a result, we believe that a similar uh, thing would happen here in the Boston metro area if uh, something was put in this region. I think the transit ordinance would be an incredibly effective tool to get more employees to share a ride uh, through one of those programs and strongly support the adoption of a policy like that and feel like it would be uh, an asset as well um, as a as a feather in the cap of the uh, of the uh, city of Boston to promote 
a program where van pooling is an option. Thank you very much. Great, so I know that um, Christiana had wanted to comment and Angela, and then we'll circle back to counselors for further questions. Christiana? Hi again. Um, yeah, thank you for your question, uh, Councilor Flaherty, and for um, letting me have an opportunity to speak, Councilor Wu. Um, so to your question about who, what are we hearing from uh, folks in the community at this moment? Um, so myself and other members of my team have been reaching out to different community partners to try and get a sense of exactly this, the question you ask, like what, what's going on and how can we best serve people in this time and as people are able to home and to work again. Uh, I think, you know, the point that you about car being choice, like is definitely a very fair point. And I think a lot of people are thinking about that. But what I've heard from a lot of the folks that we've been speaking to is that transit is not a choice that they can make. They are scared. Some people are scared and don't necessarily feel excited to get back on the T, um, but don't have any other way to get around except for walking or, or taking bikes. And not everyone is able to take a bike uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, so I think that this idea about only you know, switching back to cars, you know, some people might do that, but we have to make sure that the system is safe and usable by all, regardless of how, how, how they want to get around. And I think also as we potentially go into a recession at the end of the stay home advisory, more and more people will not be able to afford cars. And so I think only relying on that one mode of transportation is, um, I think will we'll get us stuck and not best serve the, our most vulnerable communities. Um, and I think to the, to the other point about bikes, we of course sort of um, talk with people who get around in all different ways. And many people have been talking about wanting to use bikes now um, who might not have used them before because of the perception of it is safer and you can sort of socially distance in a more appropriate way. Um, and we are very excited to see Blue Bikes offer free passes for essential workers. And we hope that's something that is able to be extended even after the stay at home advisory is ended. Um, in addition to the free um, transit um, access. So I hope that got to some of your questions. Thank you very much, Angela. Yeah, thank you. Oh, let me turn on the light. Yes, um, thank you. I also wanna pick up what Christiana was um, saying in regards to um, kind of the dichotomy that's already being set up here, cars versus public transportation. The reason why we use broader commuter options, broader transportation options, in our testimony, both mine and in, um, and in Juliet's, is because we recognize that Boston does not run on just cars and the and the T. Although the T is a reason why Boston was able to become what it is today, there are people now, and I am speaking now as the board vice president of the Boston Cyclist Union. We have our constituents who are saying that not only are they continuing to use social distancing through their bicycles, but their family members who haven't touched the bike in years are doing the same thing. And so now the question is for, now the question that we have for BTD, for the city of Boston, for, for everyone really is to how do we continue to keep this going? We don't want there to, we don't want this to turn into, okay, now it's time to get back to work. Everyone put their bikes away. Everyone put their running shoes away. How can we continue? How can we now change our transportation system in a way that actually will continue to foster this new sense of a healthier, um, new, a healthier way of getting around and even yes, an equitable way of getting around. I understand that I speak as someone who lives in JP and that I, and then before COVID-19, I did bike to work every day in downtown crossing. But I also say that because I know from my own personal experience and from being on the board for five years that the perception of biking in Boston is not just about safety. It is absolutely about safety, don't get me wrong, but it is also a perception of who is able to access biking facilities in the city of Boston. And so this is why we have over at BCU, not just at T for Mass, but we're really urging the city to take a deeper look, another look, and to really start pushing for there to be protected and connected bike lanes going throughout Boston. Because we don't think that people are just going to put their bikes away at the end of this, at the end of this pandemic, where we want to. And we understand that people are going to, the people are still going to be a little bit scared to get on the, get on the bus or on the T, even the bus or the train. 
we don't want there to be, we don't want to set up a system where people who have the means to access a vehicle, because because cars are very expensive, gas, although cheap now, is cheap for someone, it is not cheap for another person. We don't want to undo much of the work that we have been putting forth in regards to having a, a more equitable a more equitable system, a broader system that it serves for all modes and all users. We don't want that to become undone due to fear that the pandemic has caused. Thank you very much, Angela. Um, okay, we'll circle back to for counselors with questions for the advocates. Uh, Councilor Edwards, do you have questions? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, normally I'm not that much of a hot mess on this. I just got it working. Okay. Um, so, so, so I wanna make sure that we're on uh, the same page uh, and this is to the advocates and thank you so much for your incredible testimony. I think it was, it was enlightening. It was encouraging, very, very positive and also really assessed, I think the, the real concerns about how, uh, what's the right way to approach this but, and also what's the wrong way to approach this. So. I can't help but echo the prior speaker's uh, testimony. There are people who don't have a choice. They will not be able to choose to go in another car. They won't be able to choose to commute. There are a lot of people in transportation, um, the limited uh, access to transportation right now. They're commuting on the bus to go grocery shopping, which is one of the few things that are open. So for them, I think we owe it to them, uh, who those folks who are already doing it, have been doing it, to make sure that we, we nod to them and their efforts and give them this option uh, as a transportation benefit. They're already doing it. Many of them are doing it because they don't have another choice. I say employers should be giving them at least this choice, and this choice of this benefit. Um, to the advocates, and in, in no particular order, um, of, the, of the ordinances that you looked around the country, is there an ideal ordinance that you like um, that you think we should see as a model? And is there, is there an ordinance that you really find to be not of the best kind or not as effective as it could? I really heard, I heard about, I um, can't remember which cities, I think it was a prior speaker had spoken about um, the sweet spot being for employers over 20 or at least one state or city having it, or New Jersey, I think it was, having it uh, applied to all employers over 20. Um, so that's one thing. Um, to the general question of jurisdiction, and how the city of Boston can do this. I think there's two ways in which we certainly can start to do it. Um, it the overall mandate might be a question, but uh, I think we learned this through the, the chairwoman's leadership on the fair work week or flexible work week, that uh, where the city's money goes in terms of contracting should be also where our benefits and rights go as well. So as the city of Boston offers this as a benefit to its employees, if you're gonna make a contract any form, with the city of Boston, then this should be an option or benefit that you offer your employees. And I think we have well over $600 million in contracts and it impacts all industries. And I think we should use the power of the purse for anybody who has a contract with the city of Boston to at least offer this as a transportation benefit. Um, <clears throat> you know, I would hope that the administration would be open to that. And I would hope that they'd be open to just an outright pilot program for those who don't have a contract with the city of Boston that we at the very minimal um, think of ways and incentives uh, to get them to volunteer to offer these benefits. So if you're if you're volunteering to offer these benefits and you come to the city of Boston one day uh, for a liquor license, for a, a zoning, for something else, that this could be part of the considerations for your bid or for your application um, to help you get to the front of the line that you're offering this benefit. Again, this is a nod to a lot of people who don't have a choice. Um, and then finally, to the uh, advocates again, I'm curious if you had heard about this um, TAPA agreement or, or know, know about them. I think it's wonderful, actually. I didn't realize the city was negotiating private with private people right now and actually demanding subsidies, which is, again, further than what we're asking for. I'm just curious, in general, your thoughts about that. Um, is there a way that the TAPA agreements could be improved? Um, and if you've researched them at all. And I, I think we all heard for the first time about the city's new uh, finances set aside to benefit um, or to, 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 to help provide a subsidy. Uh, we just heard about it. And I would love to hear your thoughts about that as well. I know that's a lot. So pick, choose whatever you want. 
Um, but I'd really just love to hear from all of you and your reactions. I, I'm just, again, so very thankful for you being here today and your testimony, every single one of your testimony has been a true bright light. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Edwards. Uh, so feel free, I will try my best to, to moderate and it feels like no one's jumping in, feel free to jump in. Um, you can also advocate if you wanna speak, also feel free to push the raise hand button. Um, but I think Jason is ready. To yeah, I'll, I guess I'll start, um, if that's okay. Um, first and foremost, I feel like this needs to be, t you know, I feel like we could crack open a beer and, and probably have this discussion for two hours. So I'll do, or a glass of wine. So I'll do what I can first, since it be First salty vegetables with cheese <laughs> and now beer. Um, it must be lunchtime or something. <laughs> it, it, it is. Um, I have provided in the chat a, a, a link to our website um, that are, are specifically our ordinance campaign, which has a ton of information from all the other ordinances. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll say this, first start with your, your, which one's the best. I think they've all built from one another and they all have have taken into certain things. So for example, the LA County ordinance um, is for 215 people and above. Is that, so that syncs with some of their other ordinances. All of the other ordinances are, are 20 or higher, but LA County has taken three years because they've, they've addressed what Vineet has said is that let's do this slowly. Let's not force people day one. They, they've really taken sort of a three year ramp up to essentially what will be a, a full fledged back ordinance. Um, I think one of the things I would caution against is to not make this a, a situation where some employers have to work, or, you know, because they contract with the city of Boston and some don't. I think it creates a little bit of confusion. Um, I think it's a great way to possibly start that, and it's a possible tool to use. But I think, you know, one of the, the biggest issues is, is just making sure that ordinances, are, that the, the trans benefit ordinance is clear, concise, and that, again, what we have seen nationally is not employers pushing back on the ordinance itself or the, the trans benefit itself, it doesn't apply to me. And that's where the confusion comes in. So I think, you know, the, the, the recommendation I would make is is to, to make sure that if, you were, if you're gonna do this, take your time and have a ramp up and that's fine too. But if there's gonna be an ordinance, make it clear and make sure that it's very clear as to, to who, who does it, who doesn't. Because Seattle, they have a very weird, um, who, who qualifies as an employee? And the math that goes into that is so complex and so confusing. Mm -hmm. I have employers call me all the time. Hey, do I have to do this? And it's like, I, I don't know. Let me go get you know someone who's better at math than this. So I would say that that's addresses some of Vinit's concerns and also some of the others. I would also say just touching on um, the TAP agreement, it sounds very much like a voluntary version of what San Francisco has done, where they have brought in when there's either redevelopment or new development sort of a gamification for developers and employers where every action has certain points. So if you have some car share vehicles in your in your parking lot, that's two points. If you subsidize transit, it's 10 points. And based upon the size and, and, and all that, I, I will say that type of ordinance, one gives employers more options on what to, to, to offer than simply just a transit benefit ordinance. I think you'll find, and in, in, at least in San Francisco, they're under requirement, but most of them see providing a pre-tax transit benefit as an easy thing to do, uh, check the box. So I would certainly look at the, the San Francisco TDM yeah. ordinance. Jason, um, just just to interrupt for a second, this is exactly what I was talking about uh, earlier about a points-based system. Yeah. And it's something that we are in the process of developing and it's something mm -hmm. that we should be rolling out uh, later this year, for sure. Would it be a requirement? The only, yeah, the yes. only thing I would add, yeah, the only thing I would add is that it's not voluntary. Uh, the only thing that will, that's going to be voluntary for developments is which measures they will use uh, that they will that they will choose to reduce drive along mm -hmm. rates. So, but it's only be, again for new, for new, for new developments, for new large developments. So over for new, yeah, yeah, Article eighty. Yes, right. correct. Yeah. So, so, so. Um, just as thank you for that. And I did do, I was going to actually bring that up too, that you were, you had mentioned you were working on that already, but just yeah. to be clear, and I think it, uh, back to Jason, you were referring to an ordinance that would go beyond just new developments or is this jurisdiction the same in the San Francisco, or whatever city you're talking about? San Francisco, it, it's to new developments as well as redevelopment. So it, redevelopment it, 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 or new development? yeah, it does not apply to existing ordinance, existing employers. If you're, 
in your building, but because that it brings in redevelopment, you know, any, you change the paint color, I think it, it sort of triggers. Yeah, um, variance. Or, yeah, or, it may be not that strong, but I mean, you know, you, 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 you do anything to your facility um, and it, it sort of triggers this. And quite frankly, I think it, it's somewhere in the middle. Um, I'd be curious to see the impact it's had without the transit benefit ordinance. Um, because it's so multimodal, you don't, I haven't seen any reports in terms of what, what it's done in terms of mode shift, but I can't argue with what San Francisco has done. And I think even starting with re new development, and again, there's no reason why you can't do both. San Francisco has a regional or transit benefit ordinance, and then the city itself has, um, has this TDM ordinance. Uh, the only other thing I'll just very briefly, briefly say, um, and I'm trying to figure out here, there was another question that, that's, that you would ask counselor. Um, I had asked about the TAPA agreements, if you had yeah. seen them. Yeah, uh, uh, and I, there was something else, and it. if it comes up, I'll, I'll speak, but I'll, I'll let other speakers uh, certainly speak, so I'll be quiet now. Thank you, Jason. Um, I do not see others um, wanting to answer this particular set of questions, so we'll move on down the line. Um, oops, let me find my notes of who was next. Council Flynn, Council Braden, Council President Jane. Hello. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just, I wanted to go on the record. I think Christiana um, pretty much echoed my sentiments. I, I am concerned about what the impact COVID will have on all of the amazing efforts and initiatives, not only the administration, the council, certainly your leadership, um, Councillor Edwards, uh, all of the advocates, all of the gains that people have been making in terms of trying to uh, make sure that our roads and our sidewalks are truly for all and that we are being much more equitable in terms of our planning for that and that this uh, pandemic will um, create, you know, fear around using public transit and those who are able to kind of go the Uber Lyft route may choose to do that. And so I think congestion in our city, which is already or was already unbearable, it's uh, much better now, um, but it was really unbearable pre-COVID. You know, I worry that people will cling to vehicles, those that can. Now, here's the thing, those, um, you know, I'm probably, I know many of us will take the tea Certainly, you're a big champion of the tea. I don't own a car. I take the tea. I'm probably the only one who actually takes buses, you know, on the, like, th this is a seriously still an economic justice issue. And for those who have no other choice, um, we are still talking about them bearing the brunt of the burden, whether it is um, fares and whether or not we can get fares forgiven when they do ride the tea, um, whether or not we can get certain social distancing, um, new policies implemented, and then even if we get them on the books, will people actually adhere to them? You know, it, it is really difficult, and the poorest people in our city are gonna be the ones to face all of these challenges on their shoulders, and it's just not right. And, um, you know, I would love to continue to, to work with my colleagues and, and the advocates around how we think about this, because I am, I am scared that the gains the little bit of gains that we've been making and you know we've been making progress here that we're going to lose some ground um and again it's going to fall on the shoulders of those who um you know carry the burden on everything in our city and i you know i don't know what the answers are here if if advocates have some ideas around how we don't lose ground and how we continue to kind of push forward uh, post COVID, obviously planning around how folks are safe have to be part of that conversation. I'm interested, I, I know we've been on for a while here, clearly we won't solve it all in a, in a hearing, but I, I think it is an important conversation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council President. We'll go next to Councilor Sabi George for any questions. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I, I don't know, again, coming into this hearing late, whether this was discussed in any length, but I am curious about the role of water transportation, and I think one of the advocates had brought that up, but where do we see um, the impact there and the opportunity? 
I'm going to give it a moment if anyone wants to chime in. Jason. So, so ferries are an eligible use of the transportation fringe benefit. A ferry legally from the eyes of the IRS is like a big bus with no wheels. Thank you. Anything else, Councilor Savvy George? No, that's it for me. Again, I hate to ask questions or make comments that were already made. So I'll, I will review the tape because I think this is really important. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for your leadership for sure in this space. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think we're um, one round through. I'll circle back if anyone, or feel free to raise the use the raise hand function if any other counselors have further questions. Um, and seeing none for now, I will uh, circle back to Councillor Edwards for any final thoughts um, as we think about next steps on this front. Thank you very much, Chairwoman Wu. I, um, I did want to continue to follow up with, um, uh, Jason had brought it up, but all the advocates, uh, again, thanking them, but also I really, I got a little confused by what was confusing, <laughs> and, sorry, and, and the suggestion on the best approach and the best way the city could move forward. I, under, I understand completely defining it by the worker and who's an employee or not would be, I think, disastrous, right? So swing back over to, um, and, and the reason why I, I thought of different ways is because it was a matter of jurisdiction. I think when Vineet brought up the very real question does the city of Boston have the power to do ordinance just to say employers do X? That's a fair question. Um, and I, if, 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 you know, many of us think this is a good idea, then uh, I thought, well, the city of Boston could avoid that question of jurisdiction if it just moved towards, a, do you have a contract with the city of Boston? And then went on the same thing that we're doing with TAPA. Well, you have a benefit or you have a contract with the city of Boston, so we're gonna ask you to rise to the occasion and simply offer it as a benefit. And that's what I was thinking uh, made more sense as the ordinance. And then of course, the very light touch of, you know, a hotline and that's it. Now the city's not gonna take away the contract. The city's not gonna do anything like that, uh, but that um, those folks could simply call in. Uh, I actually think the city could actually enforce it more be and through education because we have regular contact with those who have contracts with us. Right, so we just put it as part of the contract, remind them to do it annually. So I, I'm kind of was I'm kind I'm confused by what was confusing about that, or, or what what kind of what headache I, we could be causing. And I, I'm I'm happy if it, it you know I, I'm happy for this criticism or happy for the you know it doesn't work. That's what I'm I'm curious about. And uh, Jason is the one who kind of brought that up as a suggestion or brought up that it could be confusing. So I just was wondering if anybody, but also Jason could respond. He may have left. Uh, I, well, I think we could, from the city's perspective, I think we can, just like we are requiring it through TAPAs, we can uh, kind of use our kind of soft powers when we, uh, when we do contracts uh, to see if that can be added into the contract language. Uh, again, it will have to be, uh, I'm speaking of the cuff here, it will have to be seen yeah. through, uh, through our legal department. Uh, that's, uh, that's, it, could that's also, it could also be a good pilot program then that yeah. we can actually see how it works when it doesn't work, uh, what enforcement makes sense, how many people you know actually use it. Uh, On, Jason, oh, sorry. He's back, that's all. On, on the employees, sorry, just one more thing. I, I think similarly, relative to employers, we're trying to uh, find some, I mean, Liberty Mutual is a good example, but there are other employers as well that mm -hmm. we can showcase and kind of say, hey, if they can do this, so can you. And I think that that's, uh, that's something when we start, as part of this, we're going to do an education process as well. And as part of that education process, we can highlight some successes that uh, that uh, employers have uh, have achieved, uh, and kind of uh, uh, use those as examples for other people to follow on. Okay. Yeah, and and, and because, because I, I, it did not mean to be overly critical. I just I think one of the mm -hmm. concerns that that I would just raise is it really, when you look at contracting, it's, it's not generally HR managers are involved with contracting. It's 
salespeople and business, you know, what have you, know, people that are outside of individuals who are actually going to be dealing with employees. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I openly wonder, and I think it'd be, I would actually love to see uh, the Petri dish of it, how it would work. Um, but openly wonder would it create confusion with employees? Am I supposed to get this or not? And if it's just a check the box exercise on a, do you offer this on a contractor sheet? You know, where's the, uh, you know, what what do we change? What, what are you changing? Um, so I, 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 I think it's a great way to pilot it perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, it's it just, I think it might, it would, it would take more work, quite frankly, on, uh, and beneath his team's shoulders, I think, to, to sort of roll it out, but certainly think it, it's it's not a bad thing. Anything is good. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and again, um, the practical response from you is, is just excellent for both you and Vineet. Um, uh, I think, you know, m my legal head is thinking the legal response, right? But you guys are both bringing it down to the practical implication. And also give an example of, of where the city is already doing it with certain contracts or certain contexts. So thank you very much. And I will conclude with that. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Edwards. Um, I'll leave open the floor if any other colleagues want to chime in with final thoughts um, or any final words from Vinit or Ella. Um, on my part, I'm very grateful for everyone's time. And I know um, there are many strands of work that are headed towards this sort of push for sustainable mo mobility across Boston and the moment that we have right now that is um, increasingly important to do so and also pre presents a, an opportunity to get it right. Um, so I wanna thank you all. Vinit, would you like to end yeah, with anything? Just, just to kind of thank everybody. I thought uh, uh, at least I learned a lot in this conversation and uh, really thank uh, thank all the counselors for and the advocates for uh, having this kind of, it was good to have a conversation uh, about, about this issue. And as, as you can see, it's something that uh, we care about a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy that last year we took a decision to have a transportation demand management planner on our staff, uh, Allah, who we hired. And so uh, we, we have our work cut out for us. We, we want to uh, get some success and I'm really looking forward on behalf of the administration to, to work with all of you. Great. Thank you both for your work. Thank you to all my colleagues and the community members. This will conclude our hearing on docket number 0285, hearing regarding transportation benefits in the city of Boston. Thank you, Carrie.